I'm Maria Carapetto. I am the Dean at the London Institute of Banking and Finance, and uh, today is my pleasure to welcome Jane Fuller. Jane Fuller, uh, she's the co-director of the Centre for uh, the Study of Financial Innovation, so most known as uh, CSFI. Uh, and for those of you who might not know, um, our Financial World Journal is actually published in association with uh, the CSFI. Uh, hi, Jane. Hello. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, so Jane specializes in many different areas, uh, and one of them is corporate governance. So um, we've got uh, excellent questions for Jane, uh, and she's going to be talking about them in general terms, and then specifically for the financial services industry as applicable. Um, so starting with the first one, uh, about shareholder communication and the COVID-19 restrictions. Can virtual AGMs work? And will this be the catalyst for better regular communications with shareholders? Well, the short answer is yes, they can. And I think it's important to note that um, al already there's a lot of electronic voting. So for example, um, COVID-19 didn't stop protest votes, whether it was against about executive pay or diversity on boards or legal and generals new campaign to, to vote against um, appointments at companies where the chairman and chief executive roles are combined. So voting can be done and has been and can be done remotely anyway. Uh, in terms of the actual communication, the interchange between shareholders and boards, that's actually a bit more tricky. I, th I think probably um, the worst case scenario is, is the AGMs that were just simply done behind closed door doors. So there was just no opportunity. Um, then I think even when the AGMs are made virtual and uh, shareholders have a chance to ask questions, I think that that's obviously much better than nothing, but it still means that there's even more opportunity for managing questions, maybe ignoring the more difficult ones, um, than having the genuine challenge. You know, so the, the joy of a physical AGM is supposed to be this sort of face-to-face, -face, you know, see the whites of their eyes, um, opportunity for shareholders to challenge management and particularly for retail shareholders. Because of course we know that institutional shareholders have good, have opportunities to meet directors um, privately anyway. So I think one of the key things is to think, um, actually voting, there should be further advances in terms of uh, nominee accounts, pooled accounts, trying to drill down to allow some of the individual the individual shareholders in those pools to vote. So I think there's still quite a lot of progress to be made there and COVID's shown a, shone a bit more of a light on that. Um, and I think there's a question about whether voting can be separated from other forms of communication. And um, that's because why, why would one, why would it be only once a year? that one wants to question Barclays about its lending to energy companies, for example. Yeah, that's a very good example, actually. Um, so moving on to ESG concerns, um, how are they actually being incorporated into governance? And uh, what sort of pressure are investors exerting on companies to respond to these concerns? Uh, well, it's, it, it's a neat segue from AGMs because I think there are increasing numbers of resolutions um, for example, calling f um, calling for companies to make sure that their um, well banks, for example, to make sure that their lending is in line with achieving the Paris Climate Agreement goals. Uh, and so Barclays has has moved on that um, seeing, since there were protests on that front. Uh, so that's uh, that that that's happened through through resolutions. Uh, obviously, there's been resolutions as well on things like diversity, um, and of course on pay. So. Um, and so the E, I think that's getting quite well established. And some of the big investors like L, uh, Legal and General Investment Management, Elgin, um, it's a very good example of where they have very thoroughly do their own screening of what companies are doing so that they try to avoid the problem of the companies sort of getting some sort of audit done. Um, and then, the you know, Elgin doesn't just say, oh, that's all right, then it makes sure that it's it has its own set of criteria, goes down to the uh, more granular level and uh, analyzes the data. So I think that um, on the environmental front, investors are getting uh, more sophisticated. So one of the things that's been thrown up though by COVID is of course social, the social element. 
Um, that includes diversity, which of course was already on the agenda, but I think it's also getting um, down a bit more to um, healthcare issues, but also e equality as well. So this is perhaps where we're going to talk a bit more about executive pay later, but it's, um, you know, show, showing that um, perhaps people at the top are accepting pay cuts as well, you know, uh, in a very small way, the sort of we're in it, we're, we're all in it together idea. Um, but the other thing is there's been increasingly some really good work done on supply chains and looking at the human rights um, abuses or problems with um, uh, child labour going down supply chains and not just to the first tier, but to the second tier and to the third tier. And um, there's actually been some good work done by S&P um, Global Markets um, round, rounding up how it, how it is that social audits may not be capturing the full impact right the way down the chain. So again, I think that he, whether it's human rights, um, equality, some of the gender issues, the, the S is um, be, becoming um, more coming more into focus. And then, of course, you know, G, governance. Well, whether it's composition of the board, executive pay, succession issues, um, I think that's also um, coming to focus. And I think one important um, advance, um, which was actually made a couple of years ago, is that um, in, in the UK, the Investment Association um, has a, a public register of protests by investors. And now under the UK's Corporate Governance Code, if a company has 20% or more of um, votes against a motion, it has to consult shareholders on why they're unhappy. It has to, within six months, you know, come out with a, with a plan for how these concerns might be addressed. And I think that that's a really important step forward in, in helping to, to ensure that some of these issues are addressed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, you did mention executive pay. So what's happening with executive pay and, and the gap between those at the top and the rest? So. <laughs> well, I was just looking up. Um, there's a there's a, a very good outfit called the High Pay Centre in the UK. Good in terms of it. Of, of course, it's probably driven by being a bit more sympathetic to those at the bottom than those at the top. But it the, the good thing about it is it's it, it collects a lot of evidence. So, you know, you may draw different conclusions, but at least you've got some evidence. So their latest um, pay ratio um, measure, where, which looks at the ratio of the chief executive's pay to the top quartile, uh, to the median and to the lowest quartile. Um, and the latest figures that they have for the FTSE 100 is that the ratio of CEO, CEO pay to median is 74 to 1 and to the lower quartile is 109. Now, I think um, this is better than it used to be. Oh. Um, we, we have, I mean, we, we have had some um, increases in uh, the pay of, of, of um, workers further down the scale, thanks to um, above inflation increases in the minimum wage or the living wage. So, so that has helped, uh, probably full employment's helped. And so we've, we have had been having some better um, pay rises, you know, that right down through the chain. Um, and maybe we've had some moderation at the top, um, thanks to remuneration committees. But you have to be careful because so much of top pay is made up by um, bonuses. Um, and so and it may also be um, paid in the form of shares. And quite a lot of that might may just come down to lack of timing. So when there was that enormous fuss over the pay of the um, chief executive of Persimmon. Um, when that pay policy was set many, many years earlier, nobody could, could have imagined the um, steep run up in the shares that took place, by the way, with, with some help from the government's help to buy, buy policy. So the, these things, um, these pay policies, they don't set out to say, we're gonna pay this person tens, tens of millions of pounds, um, but, um, but, that, but nobody, is good at predicting the course of the share of share prices and so oh might end up there but there is now a provision to claw back bonuses when they appear to be excessive through more through luck than judgment and that's something that spread from the financial services industry so um, in the wake of the financial crisis there was a lot of restrictions put in place on executive pay um, on how much could be taken immediately in cash how much was deferred and of the uh, and how much would be in, uh, so, so it's, there's two issues. One is how long is it deferred for, including 
some of the vesting might be deferred for an, uh, periods after the top person, senior person leaves leaves the bank or the firm. So um, we've had a lot of um, prescription and restriction in financial services and transparency. And I think that's filtering through now more to the rest um, of, um, of com to other companies. Mm -hmm. there's, there's still a cultural thing though, you know, you, we still know that the US, these, these um, ratios in the US are much higher. Um, they're lower in some other parts of Europe. You know, the UK tends to be a bit transatlantic. Um, and, you know, you still get, you know, the odd company or the odd um, senior executive saying, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll just move to the US. So I think until the US gets really serious about curbing top people's pay, it's, it's still um, a bit of a slow process. Yeah, but from what you say, um, could you could you argue that boards and pressure from investors can contribute to tackling inequality effectively? Um, I think that um, investors have been a well. I was going to say slower. There's a there's a there's a problem here, um, and actually, there's, the U.S. is a good example. So Bill Clinton was concerned about executive pay, and so he said, right, nobody can be paid more than a million dollars unless it's related to performance. And what actually happened was an absolute classic classic um, example of unintended consequences, in that instead, um, much more pay got linked to performance, and in particular, the performance of the share prices. You know, happened to be at the beginning of an equity bull market. And again, you've got this explosion in what were probably at the time unimaginable, you know, bonuses paid in, you know, in shares or related to earnings per share or related to the share price and so on. So you have to be so. so. But the thing is that investors have for a long time been said, well, we don't mind high pay. And one could well, we could all say this so long as it's linked to, to outstanding performance. And so I don't think it's not until you've so they've sort of got their heads around the idea that well performance is it you know has a, a rising tide raised all boats the bull market um was uh, was the target were the targets not right or were they soft or has something else happened that's made them easier to achieve than was envisaged so i think that um the um dedication to pay for performance is fine i think is perhaps finally beginning to waver a bit the other thing of course is that fund managements of fund managers are very well paid so <laughs> their heart's not always in you know the the quest to to cut top people's pay mm -hmm. absolutely so and in terms of auditing uh, it's very quite a hot, uh, hot topic at the moment so how can boards ensure that they put quality first and are changes in the audit market making it easy to focus on quality? I'll answer the second bit first. Um, I think that the move to um, separate operationally the audit operation from the consulting side of um, these big um, professional services firms um, is, is a very good move. Um, after the Enron scandal, um, these big firms were forced to spin off or sell their consultancy businesses. Um, but in the past, you know, nearly two decades, they've grown back like topsy. And now uh, the revenues for um, consultancy and non-audit services uh, account for more than three quarters of the big four's um, uh, income. So um, so I think splitting it off is important. So you've got there, you've got an audit unit, sort of autonomous, uh, focused. You've had lots of changes at the top of the audit firms that going along with that, which all of this is very welcome. Um, and you've had some improvements in the auditing standards and you've had lessons, lessons learned from audit failures. So, uh, you know, I think there's been progress there um, in terms of looking at it from a, the point of view of a, a board appointing the auditors. You've also got they have to ten, um, conduct this the tender every 10 years. Um, I think that um, the focus should be on quality, not on price. Um, even, even if you look at when you when you look at the fees for audit, they might look high to you and me sort of in absolute terms, you know, maybe tens of millions of pounds. But actually, you know, for some of these big companies whose sales run in, may run into tens of billions of dollars, you know, it, it, the cost is not really the cost is not literally not material. So I think that, it, that there is no excuse for not focusing on quality. Well, what does quality mean? Well, it has to mean 
that the audit committee, which is running these tenders, is looking for an auditor who will challenge and dig stuff up and, you know, be awkward. Now, th this is obviously difficult because the auditor has to work with the finance director and the, 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 his or her team with internal audit. Um, and but I would hope that with audit committees, which is non-executive directors, you know, they, they should be wanting to have these prompts to help them with their role of being a check on the executives. So it, it ought to work better, but and I'm sure it is. And I one would hope now that um, boards are, are getting keener on um, challenge and realising the value. Well, good boards always have realised the value of challenge and, and the dangers of groupthink and so on. Of course, uh, it, the one reason I'm perhaps being a little bit hesitant is that, you know, one fears that the, the companies with the problems are the ones who will be looking when they're hiring the auditors, one, but for the ones who are the client pleasers, you know, instead of the ones who are going to be awkward. So um, it's, again, what you have to hope is that even the companies, the less good companies, that there are some non-executives who value their reputations highly enough to think, hang on a minute, we're just not going to go along with this. We know that we want a really rigorous audit and we want some tough questions asked. So, you know, this progress, I'm quite optimistic, but, you know, I one can't rule out the sort of bad apples, the bad apples. Mm -hmm. OK, <laughs> so, uh, Jane, thank you so much. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this conversation as much as I have. And uh, Everyone, thank you. Uh, stay safe and stay well.